Hello everyone. Welcome to my channel. Uh, this channel is an educational channel for learning about many theories of everything. Uh, some other stuff too, but mostly concentrating on uh, theories of everything that you probably have never heard of because the uh, person or people who came up with the theories uh, never got any traction, probably because their theories were too close to the truth and um, so they were um, relegated to the sidelines and uh, but they kept their work up anyway put out some great stuff um, only for nobody to ever read it so I've read a lot of this stuff a lot of it has uh, positively impacted my life a lot of these people are heroes of mine including uh, today's episode, which is the 216th uh, video on Dewey B. Larson's Reciprocal System of Theory. And the Reciprocal System of Theory basically states that uh, the universe is made out of motion. Not matter, not energy, but motion. Matter and energy are merely two different kinds of motion, as is really all of the different... Um, dynamic and mechanical units that are out there, such as pressure and um, magnetic flux and viscosity and fluidity and uh, electric charge, electric current, acceleration, speed, pressure, I said pressure, uh, force, resistance. These are all uh, kinds of motion and for Larson motion is the relationship between space and time so all of these different entities can be summed up in a relationship between space and time basically a fraction where time or space is the numerator and space or time is the denominator but it is a bit more uh, complicated because space or time both uh, have their coordinate aspects, meaning that they are three or more dimensions. So, for example, resistance in Larson's system is time to the second power over space to the third power. Matter is time to the third power over space to the third power. Energy is simply time over space. Speed, as we know, is space over time. The car is moving 30 miles per hour, space over time, 30 miles of space in one hour of time. Now, um, space and time have a, they are related reciprocally. There is a generalized reciprocal relationship between space and time, hence the name the reciprocal system of theory. You can see that uh, when you go to the space uh, over time, speed, the car is moving 30 miles an hour. Well, if you decide to double the speed, then you say the car is moving 60 miles per hour. But you can also say the car is moving 30 miles per half hour. You can, that shows a reciprocal relationship. You can either double one side or you can half the other side. And you get the same equivalent uh, relationship. Okay, now, in addition to their coordinate aspects, there are three or more dimensions. Coordinate space, which we recognize, uh, X, Y, Z coordinates, and coordinate time, which we don't recognize. Um, there is also a clock aspect or a scalar aspect to space and time. So, clock time, something that we recognize. The clock is always getting later and later and later. The flow of time or the progression of time uh, flows in uh, with a magnitude, a certain pace, but it has no direction or it has all directions, no particular direction. In the same way, we have what Larson calls clock, time, uh, clock space. And clock space is also a scalar motion, the flow of space, or the, fl uh, the progression of space. Everything is always getting farther and farther and farther apart. 
You can envision this using the uh, a balloon and the magic marker. Put, put a bunch of dots on the balloon with your magic marker. Blow up the balloon. All of the dots are moving away from each other. This is the progression of space. You can also uh, take an example from the Hubble telescope. Uh, way back in the 1920s, they began to observe that all of the distant galaxies are moving away from each other. That is also the flow of space. So uh, we have these two aspects, coordinate and clock. And then we also have the discrete unit postulate. Space and time come in only discrete units. There is no continuity of space or time. They come in chunks. The chunks are very small, small enough so that we can't really resolve them, but they only come in chunks. And one chunk of, t uh, one chunk of space in one chunk of time, again, that's space over time, one chunk of space in one chunk of time is the speed of light. So in Larson's system, the speed of light is the midpoint of this universe. There is half of the universe that's moving faster than the speed of light that Larson calls the cosmic sector. And then there's a half of the universe that we're familiar with and that Einstein was familiar with uh, called the material sector where everything is moving slower than the speed of light. And that's why Einstein said that the speed of light is the maximum speed of the universe. But if you look at it uh, with respect to the cosmic sector, you would say that the speed of light is the minimum speed of the universe. Uh, Larson uh, meets us in the middle, you know, and says that the speed of light is the midpoint of the universe. Um, now, we know and we live and we observe in the material sector, the slower than the speed of light sector. Um, and that's where all the legacy scientists have made all their observations, measurements, and hypotheses. But uh, we don't know much, if anything, about this cosmic sector. And like Einstein, most scientists don't even uh, recognize its existence at all. But uh, if we do recognize its existence, we are using the reciprocal system, we can figure out uh, many, many things about the cosmic sector because of the reciprocal relationship between space and time. So uh, what we do know uh, through the process of extrapolation, we know what's going on in the material sector and we can extrapolate what's going on in the cosmic sector because what's going on in the cosmic sector is identical uh, on the grand scheme of things to what's going on in the material sector, except that the roles of space and time are reversed. Uh, example, uh, in the material sector, you have coordinate space, three or more dimensions of space, x, y, z coordinates, and you have clock time. The clock is always getting later and later and later. In the cosmic sector, you have coordinate time, three or more dimensions of time, and you have a clock space. Space is always getting farther and farther and farther apart. So that is just an example of how you can extrapolate uh, across the boundary of the speed of light to understand other areas, uh, in particular the cosmic sector. Now both of these sectors also have a uh, because of the discrete unit postulate, have a mini uh, sector within them or a mini region within them. So within the material sector, this is where the sector that is moving slower than the speed of light um, and where you have three-dimensional space. But if you've got a discrete unit postulate and there's a minimum unit of, of space, what happens when you're less than that minimum unit of space? There is no space because you only have one unit or you have nothing. Uh, you have at least one unit or you have nothing. And so less than one unit, you're in a world of time, only time. There is no space, there is only time. Larson refers to this as the time region because in this region, um, you know, you don't have any space. 
You only have time. And so in this region is the region of atoms and, um, you know, molecules and atoms. They uh, participate in their affairs in the time region, in less than one unit of space. So this is a mini unit within the overall material sector. And uh, reciprocally, they're within the cosmic sector, uh, the faster than the speed of light sector, you have a mini region that is less than a unit of time. Inside that unit of time, you don't have any time. You only have space. And so Larson calls that the space region. Now, the best way to, uh, and so that is where uh, atoms, but these are not material atoms, these are cosmic atoms. Okay, the inverse of the atom, or with the ro roles of space or time reversed. Legacy science calls these uh, antimatter, um, but Larson calls it cosmic matter. Um, and uh, it turns out that cosmic matter and antimatter are basically combinations of motion. You have four different kinds of motion. You have a translational motion, you have a vibrational motion. You have a rotational motion, and you have a rotational vibration. And these can come in multiple, multiple dimensions. Now, um, when you have an atom, you have, first you have a, uh, photons. You have two photons at the core of every atom. And a photon is a simple harmonic motion, a wave-like motion. And this motion is the result, for Larson, of a combination of a translational motion and a vibrational motion 90 degrees uh, out of phase from that uh, translational motion. When you combine the two, you get a sine wave. But uh, some of Larson's followers have uh, adjusted that, and they say that uh, the sine wave is the result of a birotational motion, where you have two, two counter-rotating systems and the combined of that, the combination of those two, create the sine wave. That is a discussion we'll get into later. Um, now, uh, so you have those two photons, and then once you have those photons, you rotate the photons to create matter. You have to have two separate rotations in two different dimensions of those photons to get an atom. And then there is a possibility of a third one uh, which Larson calls the electric rotation, only one-dimensional uh, spin, uh, one-dimensional rotation as opposed to the two-dimensional rotations of the atom itself. And that determines things like valence. And that's what we're talking about here. We're looking at Larson's um, 1979 book that's called Nothing But Motion. And we are in chapter 18. This book is primarily on atomic physics. So we've covered a lot of this stuff about the atom, but he is, uh, this chapter is called Simple Compounds. So we've gotten to the kind of the next level where we are actually combining atoms. Before we were uh, concerned with subatomic particles and atoms, now we have the atoms and we're combining them together. And so that's where valence is coming in. So we're going to give a few minutes here to, to uh, uh, let Larson uh, talk about valence. And then um, that'll be it. Okay, uh, when the positive component of a compound is an element from division one, the normal positive displacement of this element is in equilibrium with the negative displacement of the division four element. Okay, Larson divided in previous episode, Larson divided the periodic table into four different divisions, electropositives, electronegatives, and within those two, uh, you have the um, division one and division two are the electropositives, and division three and division four are electronegatives. And the boundary is basically uh, four. Uh, so the first four elements of every group are in division one, and then um, the last four elements of every group are in division four. And then those are that, that are between, including four. Uh, four is in both groups at the same time. 
So those middle groups are, are two and th divisions two and three. This really only applies to, uh, you know, the uh, upper areas of the periodic table, um, you know, the, in the um, first couple groups up to uh, element 18, uh, you have only groups of eight, but then you have group of 18, two groups of 18 and two groups of 32. That's what he's talking about here. So uh, with the negative displacement of the division four element, in this case, both components are oriented in accord accordance with their normal displacements. The same is true if either or both of the components is double or multiple. We will therefore call this the normal orientation. The corresponding normal valences are positive valence x and negative valence minus x. It is theoretically possible for any division one element to form a compound with any division four element on the basis of the appropriate normal valences, and all such compounds should be stable under favorable conditions. But whether or not any specific compound of this type will be stable under the normal ter terrestrial conditions is determined by probability considerations. An exact evaluation of these probabilities has not yet been attempted, but it is apparent that one of the most important factors in the situation is the general principle that a low displacement is more probable than a high displacement. If we check the theoretically possible normal valence compounds against the compounds listed in a chemical handbook, we will find nearly all of the positive low negative combinations in this list of common compounds. The low positive, high negative, and the high positive, low negative combinations are much less fully represented, while we will find the high positive, high negative combinations rather scarce. The geometrical symmetry of the resulting crystal structure is the other major determinant. A binary compound of two valence uh, four elements, for example, is more probable than a compound of a valence four and a valence three element. The effect of both of these probability factors is accentuated in division two, where the displacement corresponding to the normal valence have the relatively high values of five or more. Consequently, this valence is utilized only to a limited extent in this division and is generally replaced by one of the alternative valences. Inasmuch as the basic requirement for the formation of a chemical compound is the neutralization of the negative electric displacement, the alternative positive valences are simply the result of the various ways in which the atomic rotation can be oriented to attain an effective positive displacement that will serve the purpose. Since each type of valence corresponds to a particular orientation, the subsequent discussion will be carried on in terms of valence the existence of a corresponding orientation in each case being understood. The predominant division three valence is based on balancing the eight minus X displacement um, against the displacement of the negative component. The resulting relative displacement is eight, which as explained earlier is the equivalent of zero. We will call this the neutral valence. This valence also plays a part, a prominent part, in the purely division four compounds. The higher division three members of group 4A and 4B are unable to utilize the eight minus X neutral valence because for these elements, the values of eight minus X are less than zero and therefore meaningless. Instead, these elements form compounds on the basis of the next higher equivalent of zero displacement. Between the eight unit level and this next zero equivalent, there are two effective initial units of motion, as well as an eight unit increment. The total effective displacement at this point is therefore 18, and the secondary neutral valence is 18 minus x. 
a typical series of compounds utilizing this valence, uh, the oxides of the division three elements of group 4A consists of, um, uh, I don't recognize some of these uh, abbreviations here, uh, but he lists uh, five different compounds here. Um, I don't, I think there's even uh, a couple typos in here, so I don't remember what TA is, but he's got TA205 uh, and W, that's tungsten, W03 and then RE207. I uh, don't remember what RE is. And then OSO4, oxygen sulfur oxide, o oxygen 4. Not sure. Anyway, those are examples of um, elements using those particular valences. Okay, we're going to stop it there. I just wanted to add one uh, comment that I uh, forgot to mention before. When we were talking about the material sector and the cosmic sector, and then um, the boundary between them is the speed of light, and then there is a unit boundary within each one of those sectors. This is the unit of space boundary, and this is the unit of time boundary. And within this unit of space boundary, you have uh, what's known as the time region. And within this unit of time boundary, you have what's known as the space region. Uh, you can uh, see that in the uh, ancient Taoist uh, Tajitu, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. You know, you see that uh, popular depiction of the circle with the squiggly line in between and then one dot on either side. That is exactly what Larson's talking about uh, when he's putting together his sectors. Okay, um, have a great day. Thanks for tuning in. I'll be back tomorrow, and um, see you then.